Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Wednesday, November 13th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today. The U.S. says there will be no consequences for Israel's blockade on Gaza aid. So the Biden administration said Tuesday that it will not limit weapons transfers to Israel despite Israel's failure to meet U.S. demands to increase aid levels in Gaza amid the starvation blockade and ethnic cleansing campaign that the IDF is carrying out in northern Gaza. So... This confirms what we suspected, that this letter the Biden administration sent to Israeli officials last month was just a pre-election PR stunt. Um, So on October 13th, the Biden administration sent a letter to Israeli officials giving Israel 30 days to allow more aid into Gaza, but the letter did not explicitly actually threaten any consequences. Um, So Tuesday marked the end of that 30-day deadline, and Israel did not come even remotely close to meeting the U.S. demands. The State Department said that it would not change any policies toward Israel, confirming, again, that this letter was nothing more than a pre-election ploy. Uh, The letter said that Israel must increase aid deliveries to 350 trucks per day, Uh, The State Department claimed on Tuesday that they don't even know how many trucks have entered Gaza. The U.N. is saying the average has been 39 per day. So since the beginning of October. So again, nothing, not even remotely close to what the U.S. is asking for. But of course, no consequences for Israel. The weapons are going to continue to flow. Uh, Patel, the State Department spokesman, he tried to claim that Israel took some steps to improve the situation. He was really grilled during the State Department press briefing. Um, And aid groups said on Tuesday that the situation in Gaza has only gotten worse since the U.S. sent the letter and that aid levels are at their lowest point yet. A group of aid organizations said in a statement, quote, Israel not only failed to meet the U.S. criteria that would indicate support to the humanitarian response, but concurrently took actions that gra- that dramatically worsened the situation on the ground, particularly in northern Gaza, end quote. Patel also claimed that Israel's conduct was not in violation of U.S. foreign assistance laws that prohibit military aid to countries that commit human rights abuses and purposely block humanitarian aid. So besides ignoring, you know, not enforcing those laws over the, the blocking of the aid, The Biden administration has also ignored hundreds of reports. They've received something around 500 reports of U.S. weapons being used by Israel to kill civilians unnecessarily. They've ignored them and not taken any action, not followed their own policies um, in response to those reports. Um, And U.S. military aid is enabling Israel's ethnic cleansing campaign, which has cut northern Gaza in half as Israeli forces are focusing on cleansing the cities of Jabalia, Beit Hanun, and Beit Lahia, where no aid has been allowed since early October. Israeli media has acknowledged this ethnic cleansing campaign is underway. It is no secret. Um, You don't see it being talked about as explicitly in the U.S. media, but Israeli media is is talking about it. Um, And, you know, without this aid from the U.S., without these weapons, they wouldn't be able to do this. Israeli officials have acknowledged they wouldn't be able to to sustain operations in Gaza for more than a few months without U.S. support. So just, you know, it's not a surprise, this first story. I knew that that letter was just a stunt, but it's just so despicable that they're they're just doing nothing, just going to let the weapons keep going there, no matter how horrific it is on the ground in Gaza. Uh, The next one here, Israeli forces kill 62 Palestinians in Gaza over 48 hours. Gaza's health ministry said Tuesday that Israeli forces killed at least 62 Palestinians and injured 147 in the previous 48-hour period as relentless Israeli attacks continue to cross the Strip. Strikes on Tuesday included an attack on the Al-Mawasi camp, which the Israeli military has declared a so-called safe zone but has regularly bombed the area. 11 people were reported killed in the strike on Al-Mawasi. Israeli strikes also hit 
the western part of Deir el Bala, central Gaza, where six people, including two newborn babies, were killed. And we have a picture here of a man carrying a baby who was killed. This is actually a picture from Gaza City. So it's not the two, one of the two babies that was killed in, in central Gaza. This is a different baby that was killed. And I was looking through, you know, every day we have a, an account with Reuters. I look through the pictures from Reuters and the other news agencies that they work with who have reporters in Gaza. Um, and they don't put like the really gory stuff in there, but it's usually some pretty brutal stuff. And Tuesday was particularly bad when it came, you know, dead babies, dead kids, just absolutely horrific. And this is what Blinken and by, you know, this is what they're um, supporting by allowing this military aid to continue to flow. I mean, we know it. It's every day we see this and just nothing is being done about to stop this. And and the U.S., you know, could simply cut off the weapons to stop it. Um, so anyway, uh, multiple Israeli airstrikes were reported in Gaza City in the north, including an attack on a tent camp sheltering people and a strike on a house that killed at least eight Palestinians. Israel also continued its ethnic cleansing campaign in northern Gaza, ordering 130 families to leave Beit Hanun. Local sources told the New Arab that the Israeli military rounded up Palestinian civilians to expel them under gunfire. So basically under the threat of death, marching more women and children out of this area. I saw pictures of that as well. You know, it's mostly women and children. Gaza's health ministry said that the latest violence brought its death toll since October 2023 to 43,665 and the number of wounded to 103,076. As we always say, you know, the health ministry only includes the bodies that are brought to hospitals and morgues. Many are missing and presumed dead under the rubble. And then there's the indirect deaths, um, which the American healthcare workers estimate that at the bare minimum, 118,000 Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli bombing campaign and siege, and they made that estimation last month. All right, so the next one here, um, infested flour becomes staple in Gaza amid Israel's aid restrictions. So this article is from Drop Site News, and it is written by Abu Bakr Abed, who's a Palestinian journalist in Gaza. Um, and it's just his account of what it's like on the ground there as the U.S. is is claiming, oh, I mean, Patel said, oh, they're, they're doing things to improve the aid situation when it's just getting worse and worse for the people on the ground. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit of it. Uh, this is the most difficult period I have endured since Israel's genocidal war on Gaza began last year. Everyone is so hungry. Over the past week, my family and I have resorted to eating canned pet food mixed with poor quality rice that feels like chewing plastic. We live in Deir al-Bala, and like everywhere else in Gaza, there is nothing to buy in the markets. We typically eat one meal a day, usually some canned food along with olive oil and za'atar. To bake bread, we have to use bug-infested flour. Some days, when we are unable to find anything, we are forced to pay absurd prices for vegetables that are rotten. I have severe stomach pains. I would rather fast than eat this. I dream of food every day. I imagine our fridge full of meat, lettuce, milk, and cheese. I sometimes talk to myself at night when I'm hungry and have nothing to eat. I dream of when I will be able to sit at a dinner table with my family again. My nephew and niece, both two years old, wake up every day crying for an egg. Their mothers don't know what to do. To distract them a bit, we show them videos of eggs on the internet. It has gotten so much worse over the last month. Israel is intentionally starving us even more than it was before. Um, he gets into some of the uh, the numbers here, which I mentioned in the previous article. And he also says, you know, this is, it's worse in northern Gaza. You know, it's terrible for them in central Gaza, in southern Gaza, but in the north, it's it's worse. They've completely cut off everything to those besieged areas. Um and uh, he mentions a displaced mother of four children in Deir al Bala who can barely scrounge together enough food to prepare one meal a day in her dilapidated tent. Imagine living like this with young children. I mean, having young children is hard enough, but 
This is a quote from her. She said, quote, I recently took my one month old infant and queued up for more than three hours for a can of milk and a bag of diapers. However, I didn't get any. Our usual meal is cooked beans or peas, but we don't always have it or even have the firewood to cook it. Instead, we may have some za'atar or dukkha with a few loaves of mostly stale bread. My nearly two year old son is now suffering from dental bleeding due to the lack of milk. I can't find milk or medication for him. Here in Gaza, we have to pay unaffordable sums to barely bring a little. For example, you need to pay $20 to make some lentil soup. It's really insane, end quote. And then he says it's it's dire everywhere, but it's even worse in the north. So again, this is what the U.S. is enabling and supporting in Gaza as everybody's focused on the transition now, which, you know, we're covering that as well. But man... You know, like I said, after the election, you know, the first day or so, like these next two months until the inauguration, I think, I mean, I just have a really bad feeling about what's going to happen in Gaza. I mean, it's already so bad, but it just seems like it's just going to get worse and worse. Uh, All right. So the next one here, Trump picks Huckabee as an ambassador to Israel. So President-elect Donald Trump announced on Tuesday that he that he nominated former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee a proponent of Israeli annexation of the West Bank to be the U.S. ambassador to Israel. So Huckabee is, I mean, you'll see in some of these quotes here, but uh, Trump said in a statement, quote, I am pleased to announce that the highly respected former governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee, has been nominated to to be the United States ambassador to Israel, end quote. So Huckabee is an evangelical Christian who believed that who believes that God gave historic Palestine to the modern state of Israel. He's, you know, that's his rhetoric. Um, And, you know, he's one of these people, uh, he has these end times, you know, theories and everything related to the modern state of Israel, um, which this is a whole can of worms, but theologically speaking, as a Christian, as a Catholic myself, you know, there's no theological reason for me to support the modern state of Israel. Uh, But anyway, this is kind of his basis for, his view. And he's an outspoken proponent of Israel's expansion in the occupied West Bank, which he calls Judea and Samaria, uh, the biblical names for the area, Samaria, uh, Judea and Samaria. So while visiting an Israeli settlement in the West Bank in 2017, Huckabee claimed the territory was not under Israeli occupation. He said, quote, I think Israel has title deed to Judea and Samaria, There are certain words I refuse to use. There is no such thing as a West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. There's no such thing as a settlement. Their communities, their neighborhoods, their cities. There's no such thing as an occupation, end quote. Uh, Back in 2008, during his presidential campaign, Huckabee said that there was really no such thing as a Palestinian. Um, And then I, I found that clip. This is from 2008. And he's saying that, uh, and he's explaining to someone who asked him about his plan to give the Palestinians a state outside of Israel. And that's what it sounds like. It's kind of the context isn't exactly clear, but it sounds like he's describing this plan. And he says, you know, there's not really, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Um, And, you know, we can move them to one of these other Arab states like Iraq, Syria, Egypt, you know, give them a piece of that. So this is the guy that uh, is going to be the ambassador to Israel. Um, Trump said something about him bringing peace to the Middle East. But I mean, this is, again, just so staunchly pro-Israel. Um, and during the previous t- Trump administration, he said that he hoped the White House would support the Israeli annexation of the West Bank. Ben Gavir was very happy. He celebrated it. He tweeted out Huckabee's name with a nice little heart emoji. Um, David Friedman, who is rumored to be to return as Trump's ambassador to Israel, uh, congratulated him. So we'll see if Friedman finds himself in a post. But I mean, Huckabee's just as bad, you know, if not worse than Friedman. And that's saying a lot. Friedman just published a book calling for the U.S. to fund the Israeli annexation of the West Bank. All right, the next one here. So we have a lot of picks. There was a lot of action today on the Trump filling out his cabinet. Um, Marco Rubio, as the, as of this recording on Tuesday night, still hasn't been confirmed. But The Trump team also hasn't denied that he's going to be Secretary of State, so we'll see. Uh, But Trump picks John Ratcliffe to lead the CIA. So President-elect Donald Trump announced Tuesday that he has selected former Director of National Intelligence 
John Ratcliffe to serve as the director of the CIA. So Ratcliffe worked as Trump's DNI from 2020 to 2021. He was a House representative for a district in Texas from 2015 to 2020. Back in 2004, President George W. Bush appointed Ratcliffe as the chief of anti-terrorism and national security for the Eastern District of Tennessee. Sorry, Eastern District of Texas. So that's his background. And he was later promoted to the attorney general for the district where he worked from 2007 to 2008. Ratcliffe is a supporter of sweeping government surveillance powers. He lobbied for the extension of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or FISA. And this is a law that allows the government to spy on American citizens without a warrant. This was actually weaponized against Trump. So in 2023, Ratcliffe and several other former Trump officials, including Mike Pompeo and Bill Barr, sent a letter to House Speaker Mike Johnson to support the extension. Um, so that's not a good sign. Uh, another thing, you know, when he was in the Trump administration, I kind of liked some things that he said. You know, he's, he's considered a Trump loyalist. So he came in and really pushed back against the Russiagate narrative, which, you know, these unfounded allegations of Russian election interference. Um, but, you know, recently I saw a clip of him recently on Fox News pushing all these claims about Iranian election interference, claiming the Iranians hacked the Trump campaign, claiming they're trying to kill Trump, which Iran has strongly denied. Um, and he's, you know, saying that the U.S. should take a harder line against Iran with Israel. So, another, you know, another thing that's a bad sign. He's also a China hawk, and I remember this because I wrote a story about it at the time. In December 2020, he published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that said uh, the U.S. must prepare for a confrontation with Beijing. Um, he said in this op-ed, quote, If I could communicate one thing to the American people from this unique vantage point, it is that the People's Republic of China poses the greatest threat to America today and the greatest threat to democracy and freedom worldwide since World War II. So, um, you know, this is, uh, I think, the typical view of what we're going to see from Trump appointees on China. Um, you know, even the better options are pretty hawkish on China. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, uh, this one is kind of interesting. Trump's pick for Secretary of Defense <laughs> He picked Pete Hegseth, who's a Fox News uh, host, uh, basically a Fox News pundit. So this article is from the New York Post. I didn't really have the time to write a proper article about him. I might do something about it tomorrow to get some background, but I was looking into him. So President-elect Donald Trump stunned political observers Tuesday night by nominating Fox News personality Pete Hegseth for Secretary of Defense. Um the choice of Hegseth is an unorthodox pick from a field of contenders that included Senator Joni Ernst, uh, Mike Rogers, who would have been really bad. Ernst is really bad as far as I know. There were rumors that Tulsi Gabbard was looking for the position. who She would have been better, at least, than the others. But uh, Hegseth, so again, I was looking into him. He's a veteran, um, Fox News pundit, so... He has a history of saying a lot of really bad things on China, um, Iran, uh, Ukraine. He was very supportive of the proxy war in, in the early days. And he uh, recently he's changed his tune on that. But one thing that he did that's good is he endorsed the Defend the Guard Act. Um, they talked about it on, I forget what Fox show was, but he said it was a great idea and everything. And the Defend the Guard Act, for those who don't know, this is state level legislation um, that if it, gets passed by a state, then the federal government cannot deploy that national guard, that state's national guard to a combat zone where Congress hasn't declared war and Congress hasn't declared war since World War II. So it would really take some war powers away from the federal government. Um, and this is something, you know, I encourage people to volunteer with. I always put the link in to help them out their, their volunteer uh, to phone bank for defend the guard. So, I mean, it's good to see that. But again, you know, he's a Fox News guy. So there's just a lot of bad things that I, I saw kind of perusing through his history. Super pro-Israel. You know, he interviewed Netanyahu and says, you know, the U.S. has got to support Israel and saying calls for ceasefire are like extortion or something. Um, but, you know, that's to be expected being pro-Israel. It's just an interesting choice. One thing I think he'll probably be a 
total loyalist to Trump because I don't think he would have had a shot at a position like this except for with Trump. Um, so, and if, you know, there there is something Trump wants to do that kind of the establishment picks in his cabinet are against, you know, he might side with, be more likely to side with Trump. But we'll see. Again, I'm going to kind of look into him more and see uh, what, um, we'll see if we could figure him out a little more. Uh, <clears throat> and another thing, he did convince Trump to pardon um, some U.S. soldiers who were, uh, I believe convicted of, of war crimes. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll get into some more of his background, but definitely an interesting choice. Uh, all right. The next one here, Trump appoints real estate executive Stephen Whitcoff as Middle East envoy. This article is from the Hill. So president elect Trump said Tuesday that he picked real estate executive Steve Whitcoff to be his special envoy to the Middle East in his next administration. I don't really know anything about him. Uh, he's a real estate guy similar to having Kushner in the position before he was a real estate guy. Uh, we'll see. Um, I saw some pro Israel people who seemed happy with this. I don't really know. You know, I couldn't really find anything on his history with Israel. So, uh, we will see. Um, all right. So the next one, uh, so one thing that's interesting here is that, uh, Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy are going to lead a new Department of Government Efficiency. This is just a Fox News article about it. Um, and the idea, they're going to work together to dismantle government bureaucracy slash, slash excess regulations, cut wasteful expenditures, and restructure federal agencies. Um, one reason I think, I mean, uh, they better not take salaries in these positions. <laughs> but um this is something, you know, who knows? Elon Musk said at one point on Twitter that, oh, he'd like to get Ron Paul involved in this. And, you know, Ron Paul, of course, I love Ron Paul. And, you know, so that would be cool. I doubt any uh, SpaceX contracts will be on the chopping block, but we'll see what, what comes out of this, um, this uh, new uh, thing that they're making here. All right, so the next one here, Israel kills 38 in attacks across Lebanon. So getting to some more violence in the Middle East. This article is from Jason Ditz. So while officials are saying they see a shot at an Israeli ceasefire in Lebanon, there is no sign of the airstrikes against Lebanese territory slowing down. Over 100 airstrikes have been reported against Lebanon in the past 24 hours, and this was published uh, on Tuesday. The death toll isn't finalized, but right now the report is at least 38 people were killed nationwide in the airstrikes, and a number of others were wounded. A, su a substantial number of women and children were among the casualties. The biggest single strike was against a refugee shelter in the village of June. June is south of Beirut and northwest of Sidon. With people displaced from both areas, there, was, there were a substantial number of refugees flocking to the village to escape Israeli attacks. The toll has been steadily rising and locals are reporting at least 15 were killed and 12 wounded. The killed included eight women and four children. Not far away, another airstrike in the mountainous Ali region killed at least eight other people, according to the health ministry. That attack, too, was reported to be on a house where displaced people had taken refuge. So just really heavy airstrikes in Lebanon. All right, so the next one here, the UN says that Israel is committing severe violations of its ceasefire with Syria. So this is another one from Jason. So this is c confirming the report I went over yesterday, the AP report about Israeli construction in this demilitarized zone between the, the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights and the rest of Syria. So the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force, um, that is abbreviated UNDOF, so I'm going to call them UNDOF. I don't know if people say that, but I'm going to call them UNDOF to keep it easy. They issued a statement relating to the recent AP story about Israel carrying out military construction along the Alpha Line meant to restrict where Israel's military can operate. The Alpha Line designates a DMZ zone between the Golan Heights and the rest of Syria. The UNDOF warns that Israel is committing severe violations of the 1974 ceasefire with Syria by carrying out such a major construction project while building a road along the DMZ. Israeli troops entered Syrian territory frequently. Interestingly, these severe violations are different from the almost daily Israeli airstrikes against Syria. So Israel bombed Syria. Lately, they've been bombing them almost every day. So obviously, that's a violation of the ceasefire too. But this is specifically about the activity 
in this demilitarized zone. Under the terms of the ceasefire, Israel's military is not to operate beyond the Alpha Line. There is also a Beta Line, which limits where the Syrian military can operate. The area between them is a demilitarized zone in which UNDOF observers operate. Um, and satellite images show that Israel is actually constructing a road along the Alpha Line. Uh, so we will uh, definitely keep an eye on this area. And there's been these little Israeli ground raids into Syria happening too. All right, so the next one here, Yemen's Houthis attack two U.S. Navy destroyers in the Red Sea. So the Pentagon said Tuesday that the Houthis fired on two U.S. Navy destroyers while they were leaving the Red Sea as the nearly year-long U.S. bombing campaign in Yemen, in Yemen has done nothing to deter the Yemeni group. According to the AP, Pentagon spokesman Major General Pat Ryder said the Houthis fired at least eight drones, five anti-ship ballistic missiles, and three anti-ship cruise missiles at the USS Stockdale and the USS uh, Spruance. Ryder said that no U.S. personnel were injured in the attack and that there was no damage to the U.S. vessels. He said the missiles and drones were successfully engaged. The Houthis, who are officially known as Ansar Allah, took credit for the attack. Houthi military spokesman Yahya Saria said Yemeni forces targeted two U.S. destroyers and an aircraft carrier, but there was no word from the Pentagon about a U.S. aircraft carrier coming under attack. So this happened on Monday after a series of U.S. airstrikes in Yemen. Again, this just goes to show bombing Yemen is not deterring the Houthis. Attacks have only escalated since that bombing campaign started last January. Not last January, this past January of 2024. Um, so, uh, you know, I know that the Navy ships, especially the destroyers, have like very super advanced air defense systems. Um, but there is always the chance of, you know, I know in one case, I forget exactly, but it was either a drone or a Houthi missile that got through to their very last line of defense, which, which is basically like a machine gun that can sh that sh just shoots it out of the sky. So there's always a chance of a drone missile slipping through and some American sailors getting killed or wounded. And then there's always the risk of things escalating further from there. Um, so, you know, that's again, that's just always uh, a risk here. All right, so the next one, Russian nukes are keeping NATO troops out of Ukraine. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. This is a really crazy thing that this uh, NATO guy said. So a top NATO military official said that NATO forces would have deployed to Ukraine to drive Russian soldiers from the country if Russia did not have nuclear weapons. Chair of the NATO Military Committee, Dutch Admiral Rob Bauer, explained to the International Institute for Strategic Studies uh, Defense Summit in the Czech Republic that Russia's nuclear weapons are deterring a NATO deployment to Ukraine. He said, quote, I am absolutely sure if the Russians did not have nuclear weapons, we would have been in Ukraine kicking them out, end quote. He said the challenge for the West is finding where Russia's red lines are. On nuclear use are noting that Washington mistakenly, mis mistakenly miscalculated that sending tanks and F-16s to Ukraine were the Kremlin's red lines. So they did think that and then they ended up doing it anyway. Um, so, you know, this is really something just saying, you know, if Russia didn't have nukes, we would be in there. Um, I think I went over it yesterday, that story about Joseph Terwilliger, who Kyle said should be the U.S. envoy to North Korea because he's been there and he speaks the language. In his conversation with Kim about this, you know, because the U.S. says they want North Korea to denuclearize, Kim brought up Gaddafi, who gave up his, you know, weapons of mass destruction, uh, and Saddam Hussein, who didn't have any and let the inspectors in and was killed anyway. So this is, um, you know... So then you see a NATO guy saying this, you know, you're giving Kim every incentive to keep those nuclear weapons uh, when you when you say things like this. All right. So the next one here, uh, Starmer to urge Biden to release 20 billion dollars for Ukraine. So British Prime Minister Keir Starmer is planning to urge President Biden to release 20 billion dollars for Ukraine and back long range strikes in Russian territory before President elect Donald Trump is inaugurated on January 20th, the Telegraph has reported. So the $20 billion loan Starmer wants Biden to release is the U.S.'s share 
of a $50 billion Group of Seven loan that will be provided to Ukraine and paid back with frozen Russian central bank assets. And that is a step that will mark a pretty big escalation of the economic campaign against Russia. Starmer is looking to hold a face-to-face -face meeting with Biden next week at the Group of 20 Summit in Brazil. And he is expected to ask Biden to give Ukraine permission to use British provided storm shadow missiles to launch long range strikes inside Russia, which again, Putin has made very clear that risks nuclear war. So Starmer is going to be pushing for this hard. And so is Macron, the French president. They met on Monday. And according to the Telegraph, they're plotting to try to stop a future Trump administration, the incoming Trump administration from ending the war, from winding down U.S. support. And what's their big idea? Uh, escalate. So and unfortunately, Mike Waltz, who is Trump's national security advisor, who's been uh, picked for that role, has suggested that the U.S. could support the long range strikes to bring Russia to the table. And again, this is a very, very dangerous escalation. All right. So the last one here, jury finds U.S. contractor Khaki guilty of Abu Ghraib torture. This article is from Kevin Gostela at his website, The Dissenter. So Iraqi torture survivors won a major jury verdict against Khaki. Khaki, it's C-A-C-E, C-A-C-I a United States military contractor that was responsible for their cruel and inhumane treatment at Abu Ghraib more than 20 years ago. The jury awarded the three survivors, Salah al ajaila a journalist, Suhal al shimari a middle school principal, Assad Zubai, a fruit vendor, $3 million in compensatory damages, and $11 million in punitive damages. This was the second trial for Iraqi torture survivors, as the dissenter previously covered the first trial in August ended in a mistrial. But more crucially, the verdict marked the first time that any U.S. military contractor was held liable for torture that occurred after the September 11th attacks as part of the global war on terror. Um, so Salah al Ajali, a plaintiff, a plaintiff and a reporter for Al Jazeera who was detained at Abu Ghraib for six weeks said it was difficult to find the words for this incredible moment, saying that they won a big victory. Um, so this American contractor, their employees were involved in interrogating um, these detainees at Abu Ghraib and they were involved in the torture. They assumed from fall 2003 to spring 2004, they assumed de facto authority over U.S. military police. Um uh, the uh, so this is, um, again, the first kind of uh, time that one of these contractors involved in this stuff uh, has to has to pay. Uh, so that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Ted Galen Carpenter. Will Trump end Washington's proxy war in Ukraine? One from Daniel Larison waltzing toward disaster about Mike Waltz. One from Sam Husseini, warmongers predictably slated for Trump administration. One from David Gornotsky, make way for the colonel. Um, the pitch for Colonel Doug McGregor to be involved in the Trump administration. And the spotlight from Kelly Vlahos, Trump eyeing hawks and neocons for top foreign policy roles. So please go check all of that out. Lots of stories there. Lots of stuff in the lower parts of the page. Always a lot of stuff to read at antiwar.com, even if you listen to this show. Um, and if you want to support this show, tell your friends, like, subscribe, comment. All that stuff helps out. Um, I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening. <laughs>